is much better. Excellent. I will have to take a music stand out in a second. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. It is good to see you. I am um, just transparency so everybody knows where I'm at. I am uh, tired and worn out this morning. Hopefully, it won't show too much in my presentation, but uh, this week for Because People Matter, we uh, hosted a student missions trip all week, which if you have to live with teenagers for 24-7 uh, that aren't yours for a week is a challenge. We also uh, are going through a staff transition, so our development director has been hired on by city team to be their new executive director, so we're kind of launching him and sending him off, which is great, but it's a lot of transition. Uh, onboarding new spring interns from University of Portland. Uh, at the same time, we did a new Solve um, partnership, which Solve does litter cleanup and whatnot, and Love Your Neighbor event. And then Saturday, we also had one of our B-Town Kids trailers stolen. Again, just then uh, they broke into a metal barn garage building up at St. John's Church and stole their van along with our trailer. We did recover the trailer, minus some things, because we've now put GPS trackers and everything. Uh, but, so it's just been a long, a long week. I was getting done yesterday going like, oh, I can finally get home and just kind of relax a little bit for the afternoon, maybe get refreshed, maybe actually look at my sermon notes uh, before Sunday morning, and then, you know, dealing with uh, stuff with the trailer. So it has been a really good week. A lot of things done, but just, uh, also just a little weary, so so that's what you get today um, in transparency, but hopefully um, we'll still have a good good service today. Uh, announcements, uh, Red Cross Blood Drive is coming up March 11th, so we want you to sign up uh, for that if you can, but we're also looking for people to help um, Peggy just with reception. We have, you know, there's snacks for people as they come out, make sure blood sugar isn't dropping and making sure that they're just being welcome and having a friendly experience. And then when Peggy's going to get to give her blood, the table's covered. So if you're available to be with us for, for even a portion of that, um, that will just help to make sure that we are a welcoming entity in this community and for everybody coming in to donate blood. Um, and if you're interested in that, talk to Peggy. Uh, this Wednesday is the start of Lent um, and what would be Ash Wednesday service. Now, congregation size, getting everybody out. Did you know that Ash Wednesday itself is actually not in the Bible? So, with that being said, we don't actually have to do it on Wednesday. So we're going to move our Ash service to next Sunday because we want to make sure it's an opportunity for people to participate. Everybody can come and be here at a normal time and, and that connection to community. So we will not be having an Ash Wednesday service, but we will have an Ash service next Sunday. All right. So um, hopefully that works and we can wrap our mind behind it, but we really want to make sure the, the meaning and the connection, the symbolism is able to participate with the congregation and not just like stuck to a day because that's the way it's been for the last 300 years or so. Um, and then as always, gifts and offerings um, continue to help the mission of this church move forward. We're not passing the plate, but there's a plate in the back you can drop stuff off or you can mail in donations um, as well as give online, which is kind of our, our preferred uh, piece. Are there any announcements that I missed? Running in, I feel like I didn't orientate myself. Or, no, I know it. All right. Excellent. Uh, would you guys stand for our scripture reading and call to worship this morning? Let's commit to the common good. So that's kind of the theme I want you guys to hold on to this morning. And our call to worship this morning.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we're going to start out singing a song. So this week too, you know, last week we kind of shared a little bit of uh, the state of the church and just where we're at, some of the challenges we're looking uh, at. And so, so today kind of being, following along you with the story of Nehemiah, it's kind of like, what next? Where, where do we start to go from here? And this week, um, also Lori and I uh, attended a webinar that was actually hosted by the uh, Cascade District. Um, and there's an author who kind of wrote a book, and it basically said, church, you ain't broke. Right? And a lot of smaller churches or older congregations are looking at just uh, kind of their tithe and income line and going, well, we don't have a lot of money or we don't have a lot of resources. And and the challenge is to like think creatively, think outside of the box. You, you know, we have an asset of a building, we have an asset of a property. Um, there's a little bit of an investment fund. We have the talents of our congregation and the years of experience that you guys collectively bring. And, and to say, okay, well, we may not necessarily have, you know, a high tithe and offering income. 
but you're not broke. How can you think creatively? And even more intentionally, are the resources you're using focused on your mission? Right? Are you leveraging your assets to accomplish your mission? Um, which is a great question, but then it implies that we need to have a clear mission. Because we can't answer that question if we're uncertain as to what it is or why it is that we are here and what we are doing. And so we're going to continue to talk through that during Lent. Um, the theme around our Lent season is going to be that prayer, repentance, and discovery. Really not coming saying, God, this is what we're going to be doing. But uh, coming and saying, God, what would you have of us? With the resources we have, with the assets we have, with where we are socially, politically, economically in our community, this neighborhood, what would you have of us? What would you like to see of your church, oh God? And, and trust that we're going to hear. Trust that there's going to be certain passions that well up and, and being drawn to certain things and then obediently begin to lean into those things. Uh, a while back, I, I read this article and I, I shared it um, uh, of a lady who was experiencing houselessness and on the streets, and she had been a journalist uh, for the Miami Herald and Chicago Tribune, and, and so a, a skilled professional, and through a series of, of trauma, ended up on the streets. And in her journey, when it was that time to kind of move from where she had been frozen and stuck in trauma to, to changing her life, emerging out of that, that transition, she went back to a piece of advice her father had given her. And it was this, it's just that if you don't know what to do, or where to go, or what's next, anybody ever been in that spot where you feel that? Yeah. Right? Uh, her, her statement was this, like, take just one step in the direction you wanna go. And you may not even know what step two is. We may not know what the ultimate vision, mission, whatnot, all of that, but, but and sometimes, especially if you're like, well, I'd like to have a plan, I'd like to have it all laid out, I need to know things. If you're a C-type on the DISC assessment, right, you need to know all those things before you move. Um, I'm an A, I don't need to know anything when we're going that way. Um, let's have an adventure, it's gonna be fun, come along. Uh, but, but sometimes you get stuck, and, and that not knowing leads to not moving. And her advice is just take the next step, regardless of fear, interpretation, whatnot, in the direction that you want to go. Right? So sometimes even like, oh, I really want to finish this schooling, but I can't do schooling because I'm stuck in this job and I need the job to make ends meet. And, and, and ah, but there's this thing we want to do and fear stops us. There's a just take a step in the direction and see what happens. And then... Hopefully, from that step, you have more clarity, and you take another step. And that's kind of the story that's going on with Nehemiah. All right, you guys, we read through the first chapter and, and started to get into things. Uh, and, and Nehemiah, when he came back to Jerusalem to survey the city, see the state of Jerusalem, the state of the people of God, uh, he, it says that he went out in secret to do his... His survey of the walls too. He didn't want to necessarily be influenced by uh, maybe the uh, loudest crowd, right? Or the politicians or the people with the most sway. And so for us, that could be politicians, it could be social media, and everybody probably has an opinion about uh, what the church ought to be doing and ought not to be doing right now. And, and, and so he went out and he did his survey in secret because he wanted an honest assessment. He didn't want to be influenced too heavily. And when he came back to the people, he was pretty blunt. He's like, do you see the trouble we are in? He wanted like, I'm like, oh, it's fine. We just got a few minor repairs. Nobody panic, right? He, there was this reality check to it. Do you see the trouble we are in? And he began to rally um, the people a little bit. I told uh, our tech team and Susan here this morning that I was not going to stick to my notes at all, so um, I may not need this at all. But um, and that's uh, after after he said the, the you know do you see the trouble we're in? That's where the verse came back that we read as our scripture verse. 
is let's, let's commit to starting to build. And let's commit to the common good. And then see what happens from there. Uh, Nehemiah 3 is potentially a really boring chapter in the book. If you don't see what's going on behind it. So, so it happens, and, and part of why the wall hadn't been built for years, and, right, and the people had returned, is there, there was this lack of clarity of where do we start? Who's responsible for what? How are we going to get the resources? And, and so there was this lack of organization to it, which led to things not going. And sometimes the project is just big, right? I know I'm talking to some people who are talking about brick repairs, and. Um, eventually roof, water leaking, this, that. And I was like, oh, a little bit of, you know, it's too much to handle. And uh, so chapter three is, I'm going to just read a little bit because I'm not reading all of it because it gets boring. So he talked to the high priest uh, and set to work with his fellow priest to rebuild the sheep gate. And they constructed it and set up its doors. They consecrated it as far as the tower of of the hundred, and as far as the Tower of Hanel. So there was this section that they were responsible for. And then the men of Jericho, another, built next to him. And next to them, Zakur, son of Imri, built. And then the sons of Hashemil built all the way to the fish gate. Right, so basically, uh, what's going on, this is where if you do like organizational leadership, like I actually love chapter three, because like the system, how does it all work? Basically what they do is saying this, like, okay, you priests, like, you're working here. This is the gate you use. So guess what you're responsible for rebuilding? Rebuild the gate you use. Like, oh, but the, the gate, beautiful, on the other side, it's saying, no, 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 don't, don't, stop. Don't, don't, right? So we look at this macro look. If you look at the big picture, all the walls of Jerusalem are in ruin. Woe is us. Think, no, 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 no. You're here, you use this gate. Micro view. Look at this gate. Can you rebuild this gate? Sweet, you're gonna do that great. Can you guys, you guys live over here, and there's this section of the wall of Jerusalem next to your house. Why don't you focus on the section next to your house? Oh, but the gates, no, 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 they're already covering the gates. Don't worry about that, they're doing the gates. You, like this section of wall next to you is what you need to focus on. And then he went to like the metalsmiths, the people, you know, the, they're like, hey, you, I don't want you working on the gate, the, the walls. That seems silly. You have a special skill in metalsmith, and we need hinges. We need bars for all the gates and the whatnot. Can you take what you're good at, take your skill set, and use that to rebuild the wall? Oh, but the walls and the gates and the, no, 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 you're a metalsmith. I'm not asking you, like, I'm just, like, you're good at this. Can you do that? Right? We don't have to be everything. The reality is looking around this congregation, and even me, I'm not good at everything. There's, in fact, I mean, my wife will vouch for this, there are some things that I'm really bad at. And I know that. I also know, like, personality-wise, I'm the type to get any project. Like, I can start a project and get it to, like, 90% done. I like starting from scratch. I like all those last-minute details, finishing things, right? I started to repaint the office, a uh, little pastoral study over there. If you go in there and look, like, you will see trims not finished. Because um, that last 10%, it just, man, it, it kills me. It just drains me. I don't have a passion for that little detail. It just, right? So, so I need somebody in my life who's good at that. And then we can work together and we can do great things. Um, left to myself. Like, my entire world would be full of half-done projects that aren't finished, right? Big uh, birthday present for my wife, I think I actually said this, was to finish the bathroom remodel that we kind of did. Um, and there was some trim and, and whatnot. And that trim had been sitting there for well over a year. Uh, <laughs> but, and I know me, so I, I need that, you know, people with different skill sets, different talents to come along. And even as we look at the church and, and, and the state we're in and things we need to do to be able to say, okay, what, what section is next to me that matters? 
Can I go away from the macro look that might overwhelm me into a micro look and say, well, this is an area I'm passionate about. This is a skill set that I have that I can bring. Can I lean into that? And can I trust, and this is also where we believe in community, can I trust that the others in this room who have skills and talents and certain areas of passions are going to lean into the areas that are relevant to them? Because if we don't trust, also then we try to hold on to the whole project. Right? I'm not an electrician, but I don't trust that any of you are going to go do it, so I'm going to start cutting wires and splicing things together and just see what happens. I mean, we can have a cool light show in here on Sunday mornings. Um, right? So, so do, we, do we trust? Can I focus on what I'm doing and trust that as a congregation, we begin to commit to the common good, just like the verse we read said? Because if the common good's happening and everybody's looking out for that, then we're going to be okay. Uh, so that's, that's a big piece to kind of lean into. Uh, another section as we go continue on, so it's you know, chapter 3. It's a tough read. Go ahead and go home and read it. It'll be great. Uh, chapter 4 gets interesting because uh, they start to actually make progress. And, and kind of around, if you remember a little bit, there's the, this group. Uh, of people who uh, basically didn't want Jerusalem rebuilt and were even mocking them a little bit and, and like, oh, it's been down for years. You're going to come in here and fix it? Oh, sure you are. It's been like this for a long time. We've just learned to deal with it. Uh, and they started kind of heckling Nehemiah and the people building. Uh, but eventually the wall got to where it was about halfway built and all of a sudden they got nervous. Oh, they may actually do this thing. And so they start curling insults at them. You know, oh, your feeble wall, if a fox ran across it, it would just knock over and fall down. Like, what are you doing? Um, and, and the work continued to, to progress until it became more threatening. We're like, hey, we're going to find you. And let me see if I can actually find this. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, Sanballat and Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashadites, this is chapter 4-7, um, saw that the walls of Jerusalem was going forward, and the gaps were beginning to be filled in, and they were very angry, and plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem, and to cause confusion in it. So we prayed to our God and set up a guard to protect against it, protect against them day and night. But Judah said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing, and there is too much rubbish so that we are unable to work on the wall. They will not know or see anything before we come upon them and kill them and stop the work. So the Jews who live near them said at these times, uh, and the places that where they live, but it says that the strength began to fail them, so the work stopped. Right? So, interesting thing here, too. Um, so far, not a single stone was actually thrown at the Jerusalem, uh, the, the Israelites rebuilding the wall. There was no physical process of uh, Tobiah or Sanballat or any of those other guys like coming and tearing the wall down. It was purely verbal threats. And fear came in. And it says the strength of the people began to fail them to the point where the work stopped. Just from words. No physical action. Oh, you guys will never be able to do that. Oh, West Portland has just been you know, kind of in this state for a long time. Oh, other people have tried. Oh, we're getting, you know, too old. We're not as young as we used to be. Oh, insert whatever story, fear, verbal thing to take away your strength and to stop the work. I actually, this is still where I believe that. I, sometimes people get offended at this, but I actually believe God is a schemer. Right, so some people don't like that word associated to God, but God is scheming for your good. God is scheming in a community and is at work. 
And some people even asked us, we're losing our development director because people matter. Like, what are you going to do? How are you going to do I'm like, I believe that God knew this was coming. And therefore, I believe that God was at work in advance. And, and there's going to be a solution. And hopefully, I, you know, we walk in it and don't insert our own human errors to, to mess up God's plan. But I mean, God's already scheming to replace our development director. God's already scheming to restructure our staff and our team to help us be even more effective in our mission and our cause. And I think God is scheming amongst this church to say, why does a church exist in West Portland, right on the corner here of Taylor's Ferry Road? Why do the neighbors who live around us move into this neighborhood? Why have we been getting a few visitors who just drove by, saw the sign, and was like, I wonder if they're open, and then came? I believe that God is still up to something, and as long as we're standing, as long as we're moving forward, then God's not done with us yet. And so can we as a congregation, as we get ready to go into Lent, and then prayer, and fasting, and discovery, to say, God, what would you have of us? What is my portion to contribute? And maybe that's financially towards some of the repairs and those things. Maybe it's your talents. Maybe it's some of your volunteer time. Maybe um, it's as I think we're getting ready for another cycle of leadership team members stepping off or on and say like, okay, it's my time to step into a leadership role because I want to see what God's doing also. Right? So what is your portion? But remember, you're not expected to pay my portion. And that's mine. That's between me and God and me and my relationship to this congregation for the common good that we want to commit to. But to say, all right, Lord, with my talents, with my resources, with my time, with my availability, with my passions and skills, what is my portion to bring to the church for this mission? And again, we still are going to do some work on mission and really discovering what it is we're going to be doing and why we're going to be doing. But I think if we can do those kind of two pieces, um, and this is where I think it's important as we start talking about what the mission is to clarity, and I used that word earlier kind of intentionally, um, in mental health circles around clarity, it, it's all, the absence of clarity is one of the key components to anxiety. Right? If I don't have clarity about where we're going, I get a little bit anxious. If I don't get clarity about how I'm going to be there, if I don't get clarity even what's expected of me from my boss. Have any of you guys worked for a boss who just, like you, you just didn't know what they wanted? And so you're trying, being like, well, let's see if this makes them happy. Nope, that wasn't it. Like, oh, you know, and you're just, you're working your tail off um, to try to accomplish this goal, but you don't know what the goal is. You don't know what your boss is expecting of you. And so every day you show up to work and you're anxious. It's a lack of clarity. And even for a church, if we don't have clarity around our vision and our mission and what we're doing, then well, what are we coming for? Why should I sacrificially or invest? Like, what is my portion to give God? But I don't even know what we're doing with it, so why, why should I give it? Clarity removes anxiety. And so we need to, in this time of Lent, as it begins, prayer, fasting and discovery to get really clear on what is the vision mission of this church what are we going to tackle first how are we going to approach it and that clarity should bring a little bit more confidence remove some of that anxiety bring some calm because also when we're anxious we're not thinking creatively right if i'm coming to god with anxious and nervous about everything i'm not bringing my best self to be able to say, what do you have of me? I'm in survival mode, right? You're gonna just get what you get, and, and maybe I'm gonna be rash, or maybe I'm gonna be like reactionary, or, or maybe I'm just gonna be fatigued, and you're gonna get like sloth, Stephen. I love naps. Like maybe I just come and nap at the church every day. Uh, that's not gonna help us <laughs> to move forward. Um, I will say if I'm gonna start napping at the church, there's a love seat in the pastor's study, but it is not comfortable for naps. I'm gonna get full-size couch. Side note. Um, I do have a blanket, though. Um, all right. Uh, so clarity, right? The clarity removes that anxiety and allows us to be creative. 
Um, and, and then even that piece of, of breaking down the work. So what is in front of me? What is my portion? And then is there clarity on the bigger vision? And I think as we're coming through this section right here with Nehemiah, so two, three, and four is what we're kind of focusing on. Um, next week, we're going to jump ahead to Nehemiah 9. Leaves a couple chapters in between. But 9 starts talking about the people going into uh, a season of prayer and fasting. And as we start Lent, that becomes relevant. So we'll have to bounce back and figure out 5, 6, 7, and 8. But uh, for us, where we are now, what's next? We need to evaluate what is our clarity? What is our mission as a church? We need to evaluate what is my portion? What is the section of the wall? What is the section of West Portland UMC that I care most about, that's relevant to me, that I have skills and whatnot to contribute? And to trust for the building of the common good that the rest of us are gonna do our parts, okay? What's your portion and is there clarity? And if there's not clarity, then talk with one another. What should we be doing with this? I still have open invitation. I love drinking coffee. I will go out and drink coffee with any of you uh, whenever I can, because um, I believe that is my own sacred space. Uh, and work on that. What, you know, if you're struggling to figure that out, what should, where are we at? Where it's my clarity? Why do we exist? Then, then let's talk. I've been having a lot of great conversations with Susan as we're just brainstorming around some of that, the leadership team will, you know, and, and the things that I've already seen in you guys, you know, there's kind of four things, and then I'll stop talking. I can't, there's a glare right now on the clock, and I can't actually see where the hand is, which means I got all day. Um, uh, as a church, the things that I, I think that I see us doing really well is that you guys have this genuine and deep love for one another. Right? And prayer requests come out. When I'm hearing, oh, so and so isn't like, we need to check on them. There is this actual, genuine care and love of the community and one another. And I would say that not every church actually has that. So that's something like, that's a unique um, coming in, a unique piece of your identity that I see. Uh, you guys are very Christ centric. As even the sermons that I do, if I get too far off, the ones where I really bring it back to the centricity of Christ, you guys get more excited about. I don't know if you know that, but watching your expressions and your faces, why not? So, so there is this, even as West Portland is uh, a denomination that has focused on social justice, about various issues, and those are things we all care about, you don't get as excited about those as you get excited about Christ. And so you love each other well. There's this Christ-centricness to you. And then you guys love tangible acts of kindness, right? Whether it's the scarves or the blood drive, like, like, yeah, it's great. We do all these things. We worship, we read, we study, but like, give me something tangible to do. Give me a, a, a box of jeans I can put into someone's hands or some socks or, or little, you know, Valentine's cards that are cut out by, made by hand. Like you, you guys are rallying around an actual tangible pieces. And so those are three things that I see as already existing in this congregation, which I think is going to be a hint to what is our mission? What is our vision? These are identity pieces that you guys already care about. Um, and then our, our benediction that we read every week, I think it leans into that idea of realizing that people are coming and there's this spiritual hunger, but they're coming uh, with some brokenness. We're coming with some mess. And so what would it look like for us to really be a safe space, that we would be a sanctuary congregation for people with baggage to show up and then experience this Christ-centeredness, to experience this genuine love and care for one another and then to engage in tangible acts to demonstrate your faith. And we're, I'm just, just, as we go into the discovery time, this needs to be something we as a congregation rally around. I don't want to stand up here and be like, this is your vision for the next year, right? We're having conversations. We're going to try to pull leadership team into conversations, pull the church into conversation. But those are little snippets of things that, that I've already seen at work 
and maybe it needs some refinement. Maybe it needs some clarity. At the same time, there may be a piece that I haven't even seen because I don't see everything. And you may need to find your voice and say, hey, Pastor Stephen, that's a cool story, but what about? And, and I, I haven't even, we need to have those conversations as we fast, as we pray, as we go into a time of discovery. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about fasting and traditions. Typically, Lent is a fasting, and so one of the things, this is the first time I'm saying out loud to a group, um, I really love meat. And whenever I start a meal, I start with like meat as the basis, but, but fasting is the idea of going without something um, to understand what we're dependent on and, and re-engage that dependency on God. Um, and I depend on meat. And so for, for Lent, I am, I'm nervous even saying this out loud, then there's gonna be accountability. Uh, <laughs> I can do this. Okay, for Lent, I am giving up meat. <laughs> All right, there it is out there now. Um, and again, it's not just a religious act or whatnot, but it's really like, what am I dependent on? And as I give that up, I want to make sure I'm replacing with time of prayer and focus on God. But but Lent is is that time of as we build up to Easter. It, there's the idea of what what is that sacrifice? You know, Jesus went into the desert for um, 40 days before he started his earthly ministry, and that's a little bit of where we get 40 days of Lent from. But he was he was out with this intention to connect with God, and he went without various resources. Um, and that's a little bit of the practice of Lent. What are we going to give up so we can then focus more on God? And so my Lent practice is going to be giving up meat. So I can focus on God. I don't even know where I'm going to be approaching from. But apparently they make this thing called tofu. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's going to be a challenge. So uh, why don't we pray and then we will sing some more songs. But I really like the heart as we lean into this. And where do we go next? What is the portion next to you? And can we find some clarity so fear doesn't stop the work that needs to be done? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the story and the imagery that you've given us in the book of Nehemiah. I get excited about it. I love seeing people groups rally to accomplish more than they could do on their own. I believe you do amazing things when your children come together and we pull our talents and we pull our resources. And we obediently follow you and lean into whatever is next. And so, God, I do pray for West Portland United Methodist Church right here on the corner on Taylor's Ferry. Lord, I pray that we would rally. I pray that we would, um, even with anticipation, expect that you would give us clarity of mission, clarity of vision, that you would renew a passion in us for what you would have of us as a church. That we would be able to be a part of your work and that we would be able to enjoy it we would be able to benefit from it we would be able to just honor you through our participation in what you are doing because your love for this neighborhood is greater than our love could ever be your love for the individuals in this room is greater than my love for them can ever be and I pray that there would just be this beauty and synergy as we lean into discovering what you would have of us. Pray this in your name. Amen. <laughs>
just use it. Uh, I don't know if anybody, I actually got off there on my rhythm, so hopefully you won't hold that against me. Uh, if you have musical talents, Susan would love to, you know, play with others and uh, not be a solo uh, pianist and singer. So we are, uh, one of the things we are praying about is that uh, singers would want to join in and participate, that uh, people with uh, maybe instrument talents would uh, find their way here and just kind of intentionally, you know, uh, an acoustic guitar and somebody who can actually play percussions alongside of uh, 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 you know, I always think a stand-up bass is really cool too, so if there's any stand-up bass players, uh, we, we would love to have you up there. Any other instrument in particular we need to pray specifically for? Anything. Anything. Even a kazoo. <laughs> if you can play a bagpipe well and blend with Susan, that would be awesome. Bring I would. I would be excited about that. Uh, and as we begin to close, I, I do want to open up just uh, kind of time for prayer and concerns, what do we need to be praying for one another as, as a church? I know Mike is recovering from surgery right now, not that he likes attention being drawn to him, but uh, he will tell you what all they did. It's gruesome, you don't want to hear it. He was telling me, and like, my spine actually did this thing, but uh, recovery for his thumb, wrist, hand, all of that. Callie? Grace? Yeah. So dog Grace is having surgery. Certainly be praying for that. Are there other joys or concerns in the congregation? What do we know about Marin? Yeah, Marin. Marin, yeah. I, the last report, so uh, it was that she was still in the hospital. I didn't get an update, but uh, dealing with uh, debilitating migraines and actually been in the hospital since Thursday. Actually, she got out last night. Oh, all right. We have an update. Out last night. Was that it? Do we know any more? Uh, I got an email just before I came to church. She, had a, uh, she got out late last night. She has a couple side effects from the medication, but the migraines are gone. Nice. So medication worked. Migraine's gone. Uh, my wife deals with chronic migraines too, and I know that we call them uh, migraine hangovers. So after it finally goes away, but it's been so much pressure and whatnot, it's and the medicine, like, it's, oh, the migraine's gone, and there's this stage. I don't know if I described that right, but it, it kind of lingers and it's foggy and it's still kind of a dull ache um, just as a residual effect. So continue to pray for her for sure. Other prayers? Joys, concerns. I just want to say that um, I'm putting together a booklet for the church drivers and now for, for picking up our ladies from King City or whoever needs to be picked up. So I'm making a little folder that you can write your name on as to uh, what day would be available to do that. And hopefully, maybe. Yeah, so a book for uh, helping with transportation and getting some of our people who don't drive to church. Um, be helpful in it and kind of spread it out, ease the burden. And add clarity, who's driving, who's picking up, right? Clarity brings um, some good stuff there. Scott? All the people facing the board and the power to give those who try to find peace and strength for those who need it. Yeah, big thing impacting globally is, you know, Russia went to war with Ukraine, um, troops from other nations, UN, uh, you know, I know uh, the president of Ukraine kind of, uh, social media is weird at this point because, like, it used to just be, like, the superpowers and the president's talk, and the president of Ukraine is actually appealing to the people of Russia. Like, don't just follow your leader, <laughs> um, basically, you know, and, and, and the stage of social media being able to do that, and I know, you know, good or bad, we do have people of extreme privilege, and so Elon Musk has basically opened up a, a I don't understand all the science, but uh, just to make sure the infrastructure of communication and cell phones and whatnot, satellites are, are kind of being available um, so people can stay connected in, in the Ukraine, so, um, 
hopefully that's not step one of Skynet, but you know, uh, a good, a good thing there. So definitely praying for the people of Ukraine um, and everyone else who's going to be impacted by this war and conflict. All right, let's pray. Father God, there's a lot of requests, um, and I want to start at the global level, or just for the people in Ukraine and the people in Russia, um, and people who are given orders that they may not necessarily like and, and have to live that out, or the nations around who will be um, both allies and adversaries, and, and who do the ally with, and just the impact on the markets and, and all of those things that are going to be disruptive. And Lord, I just uh, think to you the, the quote that I saw this week that children never benefit from war. So I pray for everyone who will actually suffer physically. Stray bullets, bomb fragments, there is going to be devastation in the lives of so many, and so I just pray that you do a supernatural work of protecting them. And Lord, for those who aren't even hit physically, but the, just the trauma of war, explosions, losing loved ones, businesses, families, farms, like all of those things, just the destructive nature that is going to traumatize um, generations to come, I pray that your healing power would work in their minds and their hearts to restore, to protect, and to keep them whole. We want to thank you for Miriam, who uh, out of the hospital, but those side effects um, and and bringing in just wholeness and closure, the chemicals processing out of her body. We pray that there wouldn't be long-lasting side effects, and that uh, you would be able to restore her in, in just the dynamic way. And pray for Grace too. Um, family pet going into surgery and, and just the joy and warmth that brings into the home um, for sure and for Mike just uh, healing for pain reduction for patience in the healing process um, pray for Lori as she puts up with Mike um, and just that you would you would work within that home and, and give him the relief that these surgeries have led to and, and, and functionality as his heart is still to serve this community. Um, we pray for that. And just for the little tangible acts of love that we continue to do, the Red Cross blood drive, the people signing up to drive for other people, um, musicians to come in and, and help fill the sound to bring joy through through song and, and uh, that expression of worship. I pray for all of those things. And we ask especially as we lean into this time of discovery, that you would give us clarity around our vision and our mission and that we would be willing to lean into what you ask of us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you all stand with me for the reading of our benediction? the coffee out if you want to linger for a moment and just connect with other humans in this congregation. <laughs>